Hello, and welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith, featuring Jacqueline Machard and Lisa Genova to discuss Jacqueline's new novel, The Good Son, a gripping, emotionally charged story of a mother who must help her son after he's convicted of a devastating crime. My name is Adam Shuhos, and I'm a bookseller at uh, Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. Whether you know us well or this is your first time hearing our name, thank you so much for being part of our community today. And thank you so much for supporting an independent bookstore through your purchases. And thank you for supporting the wonderful work of Jacqueline Jard. I first want to thank our moderator, Lisa Genova, for being here tonight. Lisa is the New York Times bestselling author of the novel Still Alice, Left Neglected, Love Anthony, and many others. Lisa graduated valedictorian from Bates College with a degree in biopsychology and holds a PhD in neuroscience from Harvard University. She travels uh, worldwide speaking about the neurological diseases she writes about and has appeared on Today, PBS NewsHour, CNN, and NPR. Her TED Talk, What Can You Do to Prevent Alzheimer's has been viewed more than 5 million times. Thank you so much for being here, Lisa. You bet. And of course, our guest star for the evening, Jacqueline Machard. Jacqueline is the award-winning New York Times bestselling author of 12 novels for adults, seven novels for teenagers, and five children's books. These include The Deep End of the Ocean, the inaugural selection of the Oprah Winfrey Book Club, and she's also a professor of creative writing whose short stories, articles, essays, and book reviews have been widely published. A native of Chicago, she now lives in Cape Cod with her family. It is a joy to say, please join me in welcoming Lisa Genova and Jacqueline Machard. Thank you so much. Oh, this Thank is you. so fun, Jackie, to get to see you and do this event with you. So fun. I was telling people the other night, I was at a, a book event and I was telling people how I met Lisa Genova. Okay. Yeah. And it was one time when I was writing in my house and I had a childcare helper here who was helping me look after my kids. And, and she said, I met this woman she did a talk about writing memoir and she also has two young kids and she wondered if I could look after them for a couple hours a day. She's writing a novel about a woman in her fifties who, uh, who gets dementia. And, and that was how I met you. And that was at least a hundred years ago. <laughs> and I, I thought, I thought, what an intriguing topic. That's going to be a hard sell. And it was, and then it burst into glorious life and became a wonderful film and all these things. So Lisa, you know best. Ah, oh, thank you, Jackie. And so I met you before I met you too, of course, because I was introduced to you through the deep end of the ocean, like so many other readers and fell in love with you all those years ago. That and was a that, lot of years ago. And there you were all shiny and celebrity, like um, on the Oprah Winfrey show. So you were just sort of this beacon of like, look what's possible for authors now, right? Um, but anyway, we've gotten to know each other really well over the years. And um, you are one of a handful of humans on this planet I hold in the highest regard. So I am oh, so... Oh tickled and honored to get to do anything like this with you. So this, this new book, The Good Son, Son, I had the pleasure of reading early. It was, um, it was tension filled and emotionally driven and challenging in lots of ways because it had, there's a lot of, you know, emotional and internal conflict of, sort of what would you do and what's the right thing. And um, so I'm so excited to dive in. Um, but let's just start. You, you, you give us a note in the author's note that this book was inspired by a real incident that happened. Can you explain a little bit about what inspired the story? Well, I was in, I was waiting to give a, um, a speech at a writer's conference I was in a big hotel. I went down to get my coffee. The woman in front of me in line, in the coffee line, dropped her book. I picked it up. And I said to her, it was Anita DeMont's book, as a matter of fact. I remember that too. And I said to her, are you here for the conference? No, she said, I'm here because I come here every weekend and stay at this hotel to go see my son. He's in prison nearby. He's only 19, but he's going to be in prison for a long time. And I come every visiting day to see him. I'm the only one who does. Boom. Wow. And then I thought, what did he do? And I didn't want to know. 
but she told me anyway that he had uh, was convicted of murdering the only girl he ever loved. They were sweethearts since the seventh grade. And she, um, he had no memory of the event because he was so messed up on drugs at the time that it happened. She also told me in a scene that sort of shows up in this book about going to the cemetery to put roses on the girl's grave and the girl's mother coming. And she was terrified. The boy's mother thought, what will happen? And she said, if she hits me, that's okay, because she should. But instead they ended up, they were neighbors. They had been neighbors and they ended up crying in each other's arms. And the mother of the girl said, you are luckier because at least you can still touch him. And so I thought and thought about that. And I also had seen the TED talk given by Sue Klebold, you know, Dylan Klebold's mother, one of the Columbine shooters about how, and she said unashamedly, of course, I still love my son. Yeah. I wish he was still alive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I started to ask myself those questions. You know, I have a lot of sons of my own about what would you do if your best beloved did the worst possible thing and you were the only person left who would come, you know, the only person who wanted to know him. So that's how it started. Mm -hmm. That's a big question. I'm backing up for just a sec. I'm amazed that this woman spilled this much to you in a Starbucks line. Did she know who you were? No, I think that no one had ever listened. Oh my God. I think we just sat there. I couldn't turn away from her. We just sat there on a couch and I ended up, they were introducing me from the stage when I came running up the aisle. I stayed that long. Wow. I just couldn't, I don't think anyone had ever wanted to hear her part of that story. Wow. And I think she just decided that she was going to tell it right then. Yeah. And when I told my agent, I wanted to write a novel about this. He said, well, that's all wonderful, but in a word, no. <laughs> and I what? And he said, those people could never, I mean, you could never make those people sympathetic. You could never make people care about them because look what their history is. But to me, they were already sympathetic. They were already by the virtue of this sort of majesty of their grief. Right, right. Well, that's one of the, the magic tricks of being a, a fiction writer, right? It's like, how do we create a story where you can develop empathy for you know, any human, because we are all capable of everything. Um, so, so how did you do that? So like, how did you, what did, given that you had this sort of monumental mountain to climb, this no from your agent, that's a, no, that's not possible. You're not going to get your readers to care about this relationship and the sun. Um, how did you do it? Cause I, I, you know, we did, we do care. You, you, you know, you have to try to inhabit, <clears throat> try to inhabit the character and, uh, and look for that in them that speaks to that in you, in your, and in your reader. When, as I was saying to you about that TED talk that, that Sue Klebold gave, you could, you could not deny her the fact that within the child who did such, she said that for the rest of her life, she would feel grief and shame and responsibility for the things that her son did. But he also was the little boy that she raised and he had been a tender son until a certain point in his life, until very recently in his life. And I, I tried to think of those things as I was creating Thea. There were times when she really had conflicting emotions about Stefan, that he had ruined her life, yeah. cost her the esteem of her colleagues, made her shunned in the neighborhood where she'd lived since she was a bride and a young mother. And even her own extended family, her sisters and her parents at first drew back from her and drew back from him. And I had to be, I think you never go wrong if you tell the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. And I tried to tell the truth about the way that you really would feel the love and protectiveness, but also the resentment that you would feel. I love that. Yeah. It's our, 
It's our job. I learned this through acting. It's our job to tell the truth under the imagined circumstances. Always. Um, was, was it easiest for you to write and identify with Thea as a mom? I mean, you have six kids. Is that right? Don't I have them. nine kids. <laughs> you have a lot of kids. <laughs> I have nine kids that I know of. Yeah. <laughs> So was it easy? I imagined while, while I was reading this, that this would have been easiest for your heart to inhabit Thea. And then I didn't know if that was the easiest or not. Who was the hardest to write and who was the easiest to write and why? I think that Stefan being a boy uh, was harder for me to write. It was not the mother of the girl, the embittered mother who Jill who yeah. becomes an activist against dating violence. It was actually rather easy for me to understand her too. Yeah. Because who would not be, who would not lose the thread of your reason in the rage that you felt yeah. toward the person who had taken away the sun, you know, taken away the middle of your life, your very heart. And so it was easy for me to imagine her as well. The, if you, if Thea was sympathetic because she, this had all happened um, to her, she was cast into this abyss of blame through no fault of her own. So was Jill. So was the neighbor whose daughter had died. She uh -huh. was, she never intended, uh, of course, none of us lives the life we intended. Mm -hmm. But um, but she never intended or thought that her life would end up in such a uh, in such a tangled uh, web of of rage and intrigue. It um, it is what it, it's we, we make plans and then we have what happens to us. And it, usually it doesn't it doesn't conform. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, a, you know, we're living in a time where I feel like, you know, injustice and outrage is like just below the surface anyway. So it was so easy to, to sympathize and identify with, with Jill's outrage. Um, and, and, and the relationship you create between the two and the story that, so how did the story come to you? Cause so you start with, you know, this, this gem, the seed, from the woman in Starbucks, but then it develops into something that's uniquely yours, the story that you've created. Like, how did you, how do you go from that seed to the full blown plot of the story, which is, has many twists and turns and unexpected moments. Um, so what's, what's your process for discovering that? Oddly enough, um, social media played a big part in it and okay. the cell phones and instant messaging. Because it was through social media and through, uh, um, in, I don't know if I want to, if it was Instagram, but instant messaging and, and text messaging that the threats against Stefan started to build up and, uh, and Thea began to feel even more at the mercy of people she couldn't see. And I thought about how many people are victimized or terrified by these messages that they get, uh, the emails and, and text messages and website messages that they get from people who, are, who don't have any need to identify or any responsibility to identify themselves yeah. or, to, <clears throat> or to have a true uh, on-site presence, but are... Um, but are very, well, you see what happens sometimes to teenagers, how very influential these opinions are that get passed around and passed around. Uh, and suddenly, suddenly by virtue of their being passed around, they're true. And she was in some ways uh, a victim of that. You know, phone calls would come to their house, threatening phone calls would come to their house about, Stefan and about what he should or shouldn't do. And uh, uh, there were protesters outside. There were, um, there were things on her, uh, her college page and her Facebook page. And I think that if we consider home a refuge, 
when these messages can permeate that refuge, it sometimes is very threatening and, and disconcerting. It's a different world from the world in which I grew up, uh, in which you could close the door to the world and sort of uh, seal yourself off in the safety of uh, whatever uh, its nature was in that haven. Yeah, and I think we can all relate to that because um, whether it's a comment on social media, um, you know, people can get to you, um, whether it's, you know, your kids experiencing bullying online or telemarketers getting, you know, getting a hold of your number and rel being relentless there. Um, for authors, it's, it's all those one-star reviews that we need to stay away from where you'll end up in the fetal position. <laughs> right. uh -huh. Yes, that's, that's absolutely true. You know, it's, you look on Amazon and it's, um, my husband said the other day, the experience is like, you're the cream in my coffee. You're the scum of the earth. <laughs> you know? This right. is the best book I've ever read. <laughs> the worst book. It's no, like this is the worst book I've ever read in my life. I want my money back. Right. Right. So you can, you can experience that invasion um, in a very negative way, or you can, uh, luckily we have a few five-star reviews here and there that we can <laughs> feel good That you about. can cling to. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, what is, is there, is there one sort of lesson or message or, or true thing that you want readers to take away from like, what do you want to us? What do you want to resonate for us? I guess the most important thing that I drew from this story, after all the twists and, and mayhem, there's all kinds of mayhem in this story and travail and, uh, and all kinds of things that you believe to be true that turn out not to be, is that the love, that love is the one true thing. And I know how sappy that sounds, but the, the absolute unreasonable Mm. Uh, astonishing persistence of love, no matter what. It is intransigent. It can't be moved. And it, and for me, that is the, that's what this story really is about. Even when you might want to turn away that, uh, that love is what, like Elton John said, again, you know, more than a hundred years ago, it, it's the opening door. It's what we came here for. Mm, I love that. Um, and did you, did you draw upon your own life experience to be able to write that? I did. And I have, um, there, fortunately, I spent many nights, like uh, Montaigne said, I have suffered mightily over terrible incidents, most of which never happened. And I can sit up at night in my bed and imagine myself in Thea's shoes. Imagine if my children, if my older children had, or younger children had gotten themselves into an enormous fix. Like, um, I, I can't, when, when you dabble, in this sort of thing, when you go to the, those dark places where yeah. we find the most powerful stories and where we <clears throat> can possibly learn the most empathy, when you go there, you realize how close you are, how thin the membrane is between you and, the, um, and someone whose kid has gone spectacularly wrong in his or her life. For us, it's only been so far, you know, Kinahura, um, aggravated parking tickets is the worst that's ever happened to us, you know, and we were really mad about that, but it's, it's, it's there. It's always close. The, the, um, the, the slope is icy indeed. Yeah. But it's so, in, and I agree with you. Like, so I write about really hard things like bad things that happen to good people. Um, and I think that those stories do give us opportunity to realize, like, I think when mine all boil down, it's the same thing. It's that we're all connected. We're all the same, that it's all about love. Like when you boil it all down, like that's the essential true thing that we are all 
that's what we care about. That's what drives everything. Um, so I, I agree with you on that. And yet, and yet I know that you've had a lot of life experience too, that like lends to like, okay, like, so I haven't had Alzheimer's and you haven't had a, a child, you know, commit murder and become incarcerated. And yet we are right. Like what, uh, what else have we experienced or what, how do we get to that place of, of feeling that grief stricken? Like Thea loses, she loses so much of what, what she loved about her life and she was able to unconditionally love her son she was able to you know these for these characters to love unconditionally to offer forgiveness um like that's a big thing i think that a lot of like I, i'm fumbling around here i guess what i'm asking is like do you draw upon your own life where you've forgiven someone for something unforgivable or do you maybe learn how to do that through what you're writing in your fiction? I learn how to do it through the character. I imagine my way into yeah. that situation. And then what's really difficult is at the point where you are in deep with a character, that's when you really have to be honest about what the character would feel and not pull the punch. In fact, Oprah Winfrey, that was what she said to me about the deep end of the ocean, was that she said many people write about grief, but they pull their punch mm. when they get when they get really deep in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and things get really uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Yep. Then they let the character back off a little bit. Yeah. But when you don't let the character, but when you really press on the bruise, that's when the gifts come. In, in understanding a character, in understanding a person, as far as that goes, yeah. in understanding another person. I totally agree with you. There's this like the sense of like, oh, this is getting so uncomfortable. We go into fight or flight. And, and what we want to do is like what you say, like, oh, pull back, like get off, get off the gas, get off the bruise. Like I'm going to run away from that because this is just feeling too much. But if you can, if you can be, if you can stay there, if you can be still in that uncomfortable place, like what can then, what's then possible? What can you see? What is the human experience there, right? If we don't run away from it. And there's so like this book opens up so much of that, those like very deep, tough human emotions. But again, it's like at the, the boiled down essence of like what we will deal with if we live, are lucky enough to live long enough, which is, can you love unconditionally? Can you forgive? Can you be forgiven? Can you face something really hard and can still you admit it. wrong can you admit wrongdoing yeah. and can and sorry. yeah can you say you're sorry and really mean it can you make a good apology um uh, it it there are so many things, yeah there are so many things like that and thea has to experience them and of course if you're um if you're a writer who really cares about the well, we all care about it, but if the writer who really cares about the, the depth of the craft, you end up, I, I have said to you, as a matter of fact, what a cheap date I am because I cry over my own stories. You know, I cry, I panic, I feel the things that my characters feel, but you yeah. have to be able to feel the things that your characters feel, or you won't be able to create them authentically. Oh yeah. I, I will cry while typing the scenes for sure. I've done that. Um, I think you'd be a great actress. I think that that's a, a, I think that's what actors do too, right? They're able to inhabit the emotions uh, on the page and spontaneously reveal what's true on it emotionally. And I think that's hard for us human beings because we've all been conditioned not to express true honest emotion, right? It's like, no, don't cry when you're sad. Don't right. yell when you're angry. Don't even be too happy. Like just like be this, walk around all tidy. And one of the wonderful things that I think you do so brilliantly in this book is that you give us permission to feel some things that are, are really too big for us on a day-to-day -day basis, right? But they're, they're honest, real emotions, our human emotions can be big and it's not necessarily, it doesn't really feel safe all the time to, to experience that in real life, right? And they, exhausting, <laughs> they can be exhausting. <laughs> yeah. I could not feel the things that yeah. I have to sometimes 
just breathe after I finish writing a story or even a part of a story because you can't really endure that level of yeah of emotional what do you want to say uh, uh angst or arousal or something like that on every it's, day it's, it's just a, much it's stressful it's a lot yeah it's a release and it's a lot and yes you need a break um and and giving that to us to experience is a really cool thing where do you how, where do you write your books jackie i know you live right down the street from me yeah um, I, but where do you write what's your process how do you when I, when I get a chance, I go to a place where I live in a house. You know what my house is like. I live in a house with uh, seven other people and they're all, you know, they're upstairs screaming uh, at a music video or chasing the dog around or, um, uh, or co- trying to come in the door when I'm doing um, a, a podcast or something like that, trying to come in the door and saying, but I just have to ask you one thing. Um, so... I, um, I go away sometimes to write. I, I bum a house from somebody someplace, or I go to a writer's residence, which I've done before, but oftentimes I just close my door and write on a lap test desk in my bed. Okay. Um, it, because I guess it, uh, that feels like my safe space Okay. and I've gone through three lap desks in the past several years, like literally the stuffing will fall out of the bottom because I've used them so much, but I, yeah, I, I don't have an office. I don't have a library or anything like that. Just that corner, that corner of my room, that little quiet spot. So I, I, so this is my office right here. I never write in here because I'm home with either my kids are all home. The kids and the dog and it's mom. Hey mom, Hey mom, Hey mom, Hey mom. Um, or actually I, the opposite of it. it's too quiet here um i so know I, where you're I, right <laughs> I daydream so or i'll go do like you know i'll eat something or go do like a load of laundry or anything if i'm staring at you know the blank page sure. so i used to write in, i like to write in a public place i used to write in starbucks but they I still have, they still don't have the tables out here in harwich so yeah someday hi um I know exactly what you mean. I used to have an office in my big house that was gone with the wind now. But when I would sit in there, I would feel like that um, character on Saturday Night Live 100 years ago called Edith Ann, who would sit in the big outsized rocking chair like like I was a little kid with my feet hanging off the edge of the chair. Wow, you know, what a big... What a neat place this is, but it bears no relation to my being able to uh, create words and create scenes. In some ways, I think it, um, when you have a place like that and it's all curated, it's almost too, um, it's almost too on purpose. Yeah. Like a stage in which you're pretending to be a writer. Yeah, Yeah, yellow precious. Um, so do you, how long does it take? How long did it take you to write this book? Is it all like you sit down and then it takes, are, are there other things that interfere? Are you in out? <laughs> Stop <laughs> it. It's about two weeks. Yeah, no, it takes about <clears throat> nine months to do a draft about that long. Yep. And then my, uh, and then my agent will look at it and say, you know, you, the, this person, uh, why, why is she doing this? And then, and then he'll be fine with it. And then the editor sees it. And then the editor says, oh no, that should not be a priest. That should be a polo player (laughs) or something like that. And so you end up doing another revision. So I would say maybe all together, 12, 13 months uh, to, to get it to where it's a, it's the, the word book and yeah. it's finished yeah and but I know many more people many more people than um uh many other good many other good writers uh, better writers than I who take five years you know three to five years to write a book that would drive me nuts it yeah. would be like it would be like I don't know I was saying the other night you know, I'm married to the good son now and we're very happily married. Okay. Mm-hmm. But all right, already I'm going down to the mailbox and I'm looking at the guy across the street. I'm kind of flirting with him. 
you know, while I'm getting the mail, I'm kind of flirting with my next story. Sorry. And and wondering, are, yeah. 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 It's you after a while, you um you you know everything that you can know about your right. characters. And you just hope the readers are going to know the things about your characters that that you that you're going to be able to play for them the music that you heard in your head when you were writing it. Mm, nice, nicely said. Yes. Um, what can you tell us what you're thinking of next? Do you, do we do we know? Yes, I just got the sort of go ahead from my editor to write this book that is again uh, one of those. And this is giving nothing away of the eventual plot because again, there's a million things that happen. But a woman who is a, an underwater photographer, she comes, uh, she's six, but young, like in her late twenties and she's successful at this, uh, comes home to, um, to the Cape Cod, I guess, uh, to see her father who is a wildlife biologist. He's a widow who's 60 and finds out that he is marrying her best friend. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah, I know. I just try, well, actually something like that happened to me in my own life. I mean, my father uh, was dating a woman I went to high school with and I, I fortunate, uh, fortunately, I didn't like her and she was a little older than I, but what if it was someone you really yeah. loved who you'd grown up with and mm -hmm. who worked for the foundation your family's foundation oh my goodness but that's just right. the start of it okay I love it you have so, you have these great what ifs that seem to begin your stories <laughs> they're so intriguing um do, the woman the woman uh who you met in in the Starbucks line that inspired the story does she know about your book are you is there any way to be in touch with her that does she I mean, she's just going to randomly maybe pick this book up in the store someday and be like, wait, what? I would be so happy if she did, because one of the things that you get to do when you write fiction is you get to sometimes, sometimes you get to remediate what really happened. Mm -hmm. You get to heal what really happened in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, not that you can take away all the grimness or the pain, but sometimes you get to be the boss of that universe, which I wish I could do for her, but I have no idea, you know, if, um, if she, I know she was a reader okay. and I know that she was reading a book that was wonderful and respectable. Uh, but I don't know. It would be wonderful if I heard from her someday. Okay. Let it be. I love, let it be. I love. I would love for that to happen for both of you. That'd be very cool. Yes, it um, would. Oh my gosh. Um, the, as a writer, what like what's your favorite part of being a writer, and what drives you nuts? What's the worst part? Oh my goodness. What's the worst part? It is okay. The, okay my okay. favorite part is is. I love everything about it. I mean, I love, um, I, I love the writing part. I love the emotional part. I, I love the planning part, even when it drives me crazy, even when I can't get the story, uh, to behave, mm -hmm. even when I can't get it right. The part that, um, that drives me crazy, I guess is, the part about publishing the story. It's uh, hard. It's hard to, it's hard to have a, have a smooth process. And I've had a really good process with this book so far, but the, there is, there are so many details that have nothing to do with telling a story mm -hmm. that attend to that. What drives you most crazy? It's a similar thing. I think I love, I love the, I love writing. I love the creative part, even when it's terrifying and it's terrifying every time folks, at least it is for me, like every book I begin, I think, I don't know any of these people yet. <laughs> like, I don't know anything. What if it doesn't come together? I it's say the same thing. And I then, and then I go global. 
after that, I say, I should never have done this. Yeah. You know, I start to slip into the imposter pool okay. and paddle around. Um, but yeah. And I try to write things. I try to write things that terrify me. I, I you know, I'm afraid of the ocean. I, I'm writing about an underwater photographer, but I, I don't want to see what's under there. You know, I'm afraid of what of those things down there that are under the water. And I don't even like the beach. I don't like the sand. Ooh, your uh, backdrop, by the way, what we're looking at is you. I know, and- I know. That's the Brewster <laughs> Flats right by my house. And yes, I, I can't stand that stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely a pool kind of a person where I can see the bottom and see the little uh, decorations of goldfish on the bottom. But when I try to do, I try to do what frightens me. And then I'm frightened. Oddly enough, I try to pick out a story that's too big or too intimate or too difficult for me to tell. And then um, I'm surprised when I'm daunted by it, you know? Yeah. But then you, you, I mean, but, and then you write it. So do you think that with each book you write, you become changed in a way that makes you a more courageous person? Does it translate? Yes. But then as soon as I start another one, I slip back into my, you know, I I become that little uh, person again, who uh, doesn't know why she does this. Yeah. I get scared too. And the way I, I, I crawl out of it is I have to remind myself you've been here before. You've written the books before. You're not writing the whole book thing. today. You're just, you're writing something today. I don't know what it is yet. It might be horrible and you might not use it, but like all you're doing today is writing four pages or, you know, whatever. I make, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm choking now. I, I make little promises to myself and try to keep them. Yeah. I say, I'm going to write up to the part where she goes to the coffee shop. And then after that, I can stop for a little while. And now I'm going to write up to the part where uh, she first realizes that her sister is having an affair with whoever, with the priest or the polo player. Um, And then I give myself a little bit more room, but I have to, it's almost like I have to sneak up on the story. Yeah. And little pieces, manageable little steps. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, I'm still alive. I didn't die. I can do right. it. <laughs> I didn't die from fear. I can do it again. I can do it. And I do have to remind myself, you have done this before and it turned out okay. If, you know, some turned out better than others, obviously you don't know at the outset, whether you're writing a book, that's going to be a wonderful book or a clinker. Why? And well, and to, to your point earlier that like, it's, Part of what I, the, one of the frustrating things about being a writer is that the lack of control you have over whether it's a blockbuster or a clunker because of that publishing machine, right? It's like, well, what time of year are they releasing your book? And is it going to get publicity? Is it, you know, in the middle of an election year or is it in the middle of like some other conversation? So yours gets lost. Um, there was and who one- else is writing a book that might have, that you don't even know about that might have a similar- Oh, totally. Uh, theme or a similar incident and uh, yeah like Sanjay Gupta wrote a book about memory that came out like two months before my nonfiction book about memory I was like oh my yeah this happens um or it's just weird stuff like you know Amazon gets into negotiating bullying tactics with your publisher and pulls all the buy buttons or like or right now there's printing issues thankfully yours is fine but like you know, there's supply chain issues and a lot of books are just out of stock because they can't print the books. So, so always- all this stuff is beyond your yeah. control. Beyond your and control. so sometimes I think that I should be like the equivalent of a phone sex person and ha- have a 900 number that you can call and you put your credit card in and then I tell you the story. <laughs> <laughs> oh my I'm God. Tell you, and then Wait. she... Did you ever, did you record the audio book for your book or for I any? I did not. Book? No, no. no I mean, not you for any of them? Uh, well, some of them in the past. Oh, in yeah. the past. Okay. Did you enjoy doing that or no? Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I always have, have you done it? I've done it twice. I did it for Still Alice and then I did it for, for the nonfiction book. Um, I'm easier to do it now. When I did it with Still Alice, I, was, I wasn't a speaker yet. I'd never done anything like it. And I grew up near Boston. And I actually have a very 
thick Boston accent that you don't know because I've learned not to do that. But when I get uh-huh. tired, which you do if you retire, tired. <laughs> and I was like a disaster because they were like, who are you? What happened? Why are you from Boston all of a sudden? <laughs> um, okay. Well, anything, let's see. We're, we're approaching time for Q and A if there, if folks want to jump in on this. There's a person who in the chat and go. she asked about, uh, Oh, Are you okay. got reading that or am I reading that? I've got the question here if you want. I can okay. read it to you. One second. Um, so this is actually from Leslie Moreland. Um, she says, I give this book five stars. Um, her question is, do you, do you think the concept of the healing project be, could become a reality? It's funny. I really am attracted to the healing project is is something that Stefan creates when he comes out of prison. He wants to create a a situation in which people who have done wrong make amends to their victims. They don't ask for, they don't ask for forgiveness, but they do something. And the example, the first example is a man who uh, was drunk driving and inadvertently killed a woman who had uh, two little kids, uh, w- wanted the opportunity to donate a portion of his uh, future earnings to educate the children, to pay for their college educations. And they did get approval, the grudging approval from the family, from the grandmother who was raising the two little girls after her daughter was killed. And it's a very appealing idea I have no idea. I just make these things up. So I have no idea how it would be administered or, um, or who would pay for it. But I often think that there should be a way that the restitution that is made um, for the victims of crime or wrongdoing should come in some way from the people who did it rather than from the city or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. no totally um that's if anybody has any more questions please feel free to put them in now Uh, we definitely have some time for that um in the meantime i have a question for you jacqueline um just as a bookseller i have to ask what recommendations do you have for people who come in saying i absolutely love jacqueline's book like what should i read next other than your backlist of course (laughs) (laughs) um what say what am I what book am I excited about right now I um there was a there was a book that was written recently called Disappearing Earth by Julia Phillips um about I thought I can't read this book not only does it have only Russian names in it which will drive me crazy but I read it and it absolutely blew me away it was absolutely one of the most beautifully plotted books based on the disappearance of two little girls in, in Russia on the Russian peninsula in Kamchatka. And it was stunningly written. She did win the National Book Award for her first novel. Thank you very much. And she's like 30. Um, <clears throat> and she her family lives on Cape Cod. So I have been loving, I have been reading that book. At, and, uh, and I'm reading uh, The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton. I, I read really widely off the, which is about the uh, gold rush in Australia and all the, the good and bad people who get involved with that. Um, and um, uh, I'm reading, who wrote The Immortalist? Was that Chloe Benjamin who wrote The Immortalist? I think so. I don't know. Yeah. 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 yeah um, and I, I know her a little that's a very, uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful book, but it is a, um, you have to have your Wheaties before you read it. It's a very upsetting um, story. And then all kinds of, I read all kinds of, um, give me a British mystery and I'm happy. (laughs) You know, I have to have um, a, a place with a vicar. I have to have a vicar. And then the things that pe- <laughs> the things that people have for lunch, like sponge cake and stuff like that, I would I would get along with those people very well. 
And anything that Lisa writes, anything that any uh, like another pal of mine, Ann Patchett, anything she writes, I'm going to read. I've read everything Elizabeth Stroud has read and loved everything that she's read. I'm holding back on <clears throat> reading her new book, Oh, William, because I'm I have to I'm making myself accomplish something with my next book before I give myself the treat of reading it. Nice. That's, so cool. that's uh, so funny about Disappearing Earth. I must have stocked that book a million times and I had absolutely no idea what it was actually about <laughs> until you just told me. That's, it sounds amazing. If you read the end of the book, it I mean, I assume you're a big reader. OK, mm -hmm. it's as good an ending as any other as it's better than any other book that I've ever read. At really? the end of it, I was literally I was gasping. <laughs> That's that's awesome because sometimes like I mean I'm I'm not a writer but it often feels like uh, that's what writers struggle with a lot is endings and you can sometimes read that in work that there's some people just like don't know how to stick an ending and that's uh that's awesome to hear. There are some writers who just weave this wonderful tale right up to the end mm -hmm. and then it's sort of like and then everyone got run over by a truck. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind and, of left on. <laughs> I just have to get out of here because I can't take it. <laughs> Uh, we got another question in from uh, Moira McDermott. Um, Moira says, uh, the story is spellbinding, just absolutely fell in love with the characters. Um, do we see this as a film? Well, from your mouth to God's ears, I, all the people, all the authors who say, oh, I would never want it to be made into a movie because they would just ruin it, are lying. Yeah. Uh, secretly, <laughs> secretly, right, Lisa? They secretly, they want nothing more than for it to be made into a movie. And here's a here's something that you may not know. Um, they don't, when they option a, uh, a book for a film, they don't say to you here, you have to take this lot of money here or we're going to shoot this little puppy that we're holding here. We're going to shoot it right in the head. Oh. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> it's voluntary. I mean, people allow that to happen and then they complain about it. And so the way that I feel is either you could complain about it or you can take the money, but not both. And you may not be happy or joyous about the way the movie turn out. Sometimes turns out sometimes you're very lucky and the film is an honor to the book. And sometimes it isn't. It's a different experience. But I would absolutely love it to be made into a movie. And there are so few characters they could probably afford to do it. And it would only have to be in a little town in Wisconsin. <laughs> That's I totally see it. Um, it's a question from uh, Lori B. Uh, thank you for tonight. Um, she looks forward to reading. Uh, could you each say how you made the jump to writing your first stories? Go, Lisa, go. Oh, no, Jackie, this is your show, honey. You go okay, first. okay, well, all right. Um, as I said at the beginning, I was, uh, I was widowed in my 30s and I started to write a novel because I love novels, but I had never done any creative writing. I had never really done anything other than write a short story in uh, college or something like that. So I decided that I would try, I, I imagined my way into it by saying I would write a whole bunch of short stories about this one character and then knit them together. And maybe that's what I did, but I wanted to try to do something to prove to myself and to my kids who were very young then, my three kids, my three sons who are grown up now were very three, six and nine at that time, that we would have a life hereafter. You know, we would have some laughs and uh, part of my part of that for me was doing something impossible and accomplishing something that would make me feel like a leader, like a leader of men for my three little kids. But I never imagined how um, how successful the book would be. Of course, that was a long time ago. And as anyone will tell you, you're only as much of a sensation as your last book was. Um, you can, you know, I'll be sitting at the end of the bar someday, though I don't even drink. I'll be saying, you know, I wrote the good, I wrote the deep end of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> my, my kids, by the way, my grown up kids say to me, 
can you get Lisa to sign my book for me? You know, she wrote Still Alice. And I'll be like, hey, you know, what am I? I'm a chap liver. Exactly. No, you'll be at the end of that bar and you'll be talking about the deep end of the ocean and the good sun. Because this is, I so see this as a movie. It's so visceral. It's so vividly imagined. It's so timely. I mean, they, somebody somebody needs to option this. Like immediately. I would like that. Totally. I would definitely yeah. like that. How did you decide to write a novel like you I wasn't trained it wasn't you know this was not the expectation my grandmother had Alzheimer's I was a neuroscientist so I learned everything I could about Alzheimer's to help my family and we I learned a lot but everything was written by a scientist or a doctor or a caregiver and it lacked the perspective of the person with it and my grandmother was pretty far along by the time we all actually recognized that this was Alzheimer's because we were in denial and she was hiding it. And we had that false expectation that you're supposed to become forgetful as you get older. Um, so for all these reasons, I couldn't ask my grandmother, what does it feel like? Because she didn't really understand what was going on at that point. And I had great sympathy for her. I felt really bad for her and bad for us. It was awful to, you know, she didn't know who any of us were anymore. And we all loved her so much, um, but I didn't know how to feel with her. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to get to empathy with my grandmother. I was so uncomfortable by her about with her Alzheimer's. I didn't know how to sit with that and not go into fight or flight. Um, but I remember thinking, well, fiction is a place where you can explore empathy and walk in someone else's shoes and, and get the perspective of someone who's difficult to understand. And I'm like, all the books I'm reading about Alzheimer's are nonfiction. And at the time there really wasn't a fictional story um, told about Alzheimer's from the perspective of a woman with it. And so I just made that leap that, well, someday I'll write a book about Alzheimer's a, a novel and I'll tell it from her point of view and I'll do it when I'm retired. Um, but a few things happened. I ended up getting, uh, I had a baby. I, my marriage was falling apart. Like the second she was born, I hung in there for a couple more years and then was separated and divorced. And I was an unemployed, divorced, single mom. My life felt like it had unraveled and I felt ashamed and unacceptable. And very weirdly in that moment, instead of like, oh, well, go do the stable thing, which is like, do the thing that you're trained and educated to do. I was like, what if I try to write the novel now? <laughs> so similar, right. Jackie, right? It's like, I'm going to go try to do this thing that feels impossible that I have no right to do because you know, who am I to be writing a book? But it was my, it was my truth. It was, I really want to do this. This is, I feel compelled to write, try to write this story. And that was the still. risk itself, the risk itself, though, is, I mean, it causes you to have, taking the risk causes you to have courage, too. Yeah. Somehow. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the courage doesn't come before the risk sometimes. The risk comes before the courage. No, and you, and you develop that muscle, because I remember feeling really scared, and I would go into libraries or bookstores and look at all of the books and think, well, these people did it. Why can't I? can't be impossible. They did it. Look at all the books. So I would just sort of drum up the courage. And again, like taking the small bites, like, okay, well, today I'm going to interview a neurologist. Like, today I'm going to write 1500 words. Like that's just, that's it. So piece by piece. And then, and then, and you know, did you think about how are people going to accept this story? How are no, people I didn't know it? anything. I don't know about you, but I didn't know what I didn't know. I, my world was, you know, neuroscience geeks. Like I didn't know any writers. I didn't know like what was possible or impossible. I didn't know how to make a living as a writer. I didn't know any of the details of this career. I, I wasn't career minded. I was, I was like, I'm going to write this book and I'd love to see it published. And I think along the way, also in coming to know all the people I came to know with Alzheimer's, I, I recognize like, oh, if this actually works, like I have a responsibility and an opportunity to the people who live with this to give them a face and a voice. So it became very mission driven. Mm -hmm. um, so it was more like, oh, if I can get the world to, to, to become familiar with Alzheimer's in a way that humanizes it, that would be a really a cool thing to be able to do. Um, so it was all accidental. I didn't mean to have a career in writing. And I well, you, you, <laughs> you roared back with that lack of intention there. I don't think I ever intend, I didn't think, 
<clears throat> I thought I would be a person who had written a book. Yeah. I didn't think that I would write a whole bunch of them. And I also didn't know, <clears throat> I didn't know that everybody in a book was supposed to be agreeable either. I had, uh, when I f- wrote my first novel and I was writing about Beth Capadora, I thought her, she's lost her child and it was her fault. Yeah. and was on her watch. And she's, uh, she withdraws and she's angry and she doesn't want anything to do with her other kids and she doesn't want anything to do with her husband. I thought that's how you would really be. And then people were saying to me, oh no, if it was me, I'd be, I'd be much tenderer and braver. The fact is you don't know how you would really be if you were cast into a state of, of loss and despair. But what I was tapping into was being widowed. Yeah. And suddenly here I was in this situation that I had never imagined finding myself in and with the rest of my life uh, with what would probably be judging by my relatives, a relatively long life to live if nothing happened to me. And, uh, and how was I going to live that? And I was able to say, that Beth had to imagine that she was going to live the rest of her life without her little boy. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. (laughs) That's, um, we're just about out of time, but I think we can fit in one more question. Um, This is from an anonymous attendee. Um, Can you talk about the father's involvement or non-involvement in this story? I, 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 I wish, I I think that the father was not as involved because he was not as, and I'm going to do something that I really don't believe that I should do, use impact uh, in this way, impacted as a verb. He was not as impacted by the, by the whole drama that surrounded uh, the son being incarcerated and by the, the him coming out of prison, he was, in a sense, um, able to distance himself from that because he had a whole other milieu as a popular coach and uh, a community leader. And so it fell more on, on Thea. And as a result of that, he seemed less involved with it, though definitely... Um, loved his son equally, but he did not understand him. He didn't understand his, his son was not the little jock that he thought that he was going to raise. You know, he, he was um, a much different kind of kid and ironically a much gentler kind of kid who his father said lacked the killer instinct. That's just a interesting turn of phrase in the book. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, I'm sorry that we are out of time. I wish that we could do like another hour of this. You guys were awesome. Um, thank you so much, like both of you for being here. Thank you so much. And thank you. Mm, thank you, sweet Lisa. Thank you, sweet Jackie. Friend. Wonderful. Everybody read her book. Everybody buy it, <laughs> gift it, love it, rate and it. That's, if anybody does not have a copy yet, you can go to the Eventbrite page where you register for this event. You can buy a copy there. You can go to our uh, online store, brooklinebooksmith.com or just come on into the store. I have Jacqueline's book right on the hardcover table, right in the front of the store uh, waiting for you. Um, but, and share uh, it on social media with people. Tell everybody about it because we can't go sure. on normal book tours and she needs. we need all the help. So tell everybody. Definitely. Thank you so much, guys.